Um, so I'll do a, a quick review of last week, um, just to get everybody kind of up to speed. Um, the, uh, one of the most critical features of the Hebrew language is that it is written in red right to left. Okay, Opposite of English, which of course we write and read left to right. So that's important, <laughs> if you didn't know that. Um, last week we covered the, we went a little farther than I intended to, um, but that's fine. Uh, we covered the first letter, Aleph, second letter, Beit. Beit can make two sounds with this dot in the center called a dagish, makes the sound of the letter B. Without that dot, makes the sound of the letter V. The Aleph is silent. And um, we learned one vowel symbol, the comets, which makes the sound of a short A, ah, as in father or wall. And we learned one word that we can u uh, use these letters to form, an Aleph with a comets vowel, followed by a bait with no dogish. So the order of pronunciation is consonant, vowel attached to consonant, next consonant, and if this word were longer, we would just keep jumping like this to pronounce the entire word. So the Aleph is silent, the comets makes an ah, the bait with no dogish makes a v, so this is pronounced av, Aleph bait, av, and av means father. So that's last week in a nutshell. <laughs> and uh, we also covered two other letters, but I intended to cover those this week, so I'm going to cover them again this week and move forward from there. Okay. And if anybody has a question, don't be shy to ask. All right, so third letter of the Hebrew alphabet is Gimel. Gimel looks like this. Gimel makes the sound of a hard G, G as in girl or goat. Numerical value of Gimel is three. Yes. Yes, G as in good. <laughs> yes, good girl. Although, in Hebrew, <clears throat> the letter has nothing to do with a girl per se. Um, in Paleo-Hebrew, Gimel is depicted like this, and it represents a camel's hump. In fact, the Hebrew word gamal means a camel. Uh, the Gimel became the Greek gamma and the Latin C. Uh, a noteworthy feature of the Gimel. In my writing, I exaggerate this bottom area here, but in other texts, you want to pay close attention to the leg on the bottom right, because that leg is the thing that differentiates the Gimel from the Nun. Again, the way I write it, it's very obvious what the difference is, but some fonts are uh, not as forgiving. <laughs> so do pay attention to the bottom right whenever you see a gimel looking letter to verify that it's a gimel. Okay, so that's the third letter, gimel. Fourth letter is Dalit. Dalit makes the sound of the letter D, as in dog. Being the fourth letter, its numerical value is four. 
Um, like, like the gimel and the bait, you have to pay attention to this little tail on the dollet on the top right, because that is the only thing that differentiates the dollet from the raish. And these two letters are the most frequently mixed up, one for the other. Um, so don't feel bad if you mix them up. In the Paleo-Hebrew, you would never mix it up with a resh because it's basically a triangle. And the Hebrew word delet means a door. And so this triangle is thought to represent a tent flap. Um, and this became the Greek letter delta which doesn't take much imagination, <clears throat> and the Latin D. And then using the dalet and the gimel, we can form a word. So a dalet with a comet's vowel underneath, followed by a gimel. Okay, Dalit makes the sound of the letter D, Comets makes the short A sound, and Gimel makes a G. So this is pronounced dog, but it is not a dog. In fact, dog is a fish. So we have two words now, av and dog. Okay. Any questions about Gimel or Dalit? All right. All right. All right. Our fifth letter is the hay. Hey functions uh, just like the English letter H, or almost just like. Um, it makes the H huh sound as in hey, but at the end of a word it is silent, just like the H at the end of Winnie the Pooh. Um, although English has words like honest in which the H is silent elsewhere, but in Hebrew it is always pronounced except at the end of a word. So. Fifth letter, its numerical value is five. Um, the he, and again, these early letters have the unfortunate property of being very similar to other letters later on. There's this gap here on the upper left side, and that is what differentiates the he from another letter. And especially in small, small type, this is confused very frequently. Um, so remember this gap when you're writing and reading the hay. In Paleo-Hebrew, the hay looked something like this. And um, it could represent a number of things. It's frequently thought to represent a window. Um, regardless of the exact representation it became, the Greek epsilon and Latin E. And just to give a preview of uh, when we get into intermediate Hebrew, many words that end in a hey, not all, but many, are feminine words. Hebrew has masculine and feminine gender attached to every one of their words. That's a subject we will cover in intermediate Hebrew more extensively. But the hey at the end of a word is frequently, not always, frequently <laughs> an indicator of the feminine gender. So, and in fact, in Hebrew names, you'll notice that um, a number of times. Names like Sarah, Rebecca, that A-H sound at the end is a pretty good giveaway that you're dealing with a feminine name. So again, not always. Isaiah is not a feminine name. Okay, so, but anyway, just something to have in the back of your mind for later. Yes? You say the hey is always pronounced at the beginning of the word. 
Yes, the hey is always pronounced at the beginning of a word or in the middle of a word, it is always pronounced. Except at the end, it is silent. Ruach is, okay, jumping ahead, ruach is a feminine noun, but it does not end in a hey. Okay, so. Okay, so that's the hey. Okay, our sixth letter is the letter vav. Um, Vav has a number of look-alikes, but when you see them side by side, it's pretty easy to tell them apart. The yod is much smaller. The resh is longer on the top. The nun has the foot at the bottom. Okay, so you probably won't confuse Vav for any other letters. But that's what it looks like in comparison to other letters. Uh, yes, it could be also be confused for a final nun, but a final nun, which we'll get to later, extends much farther down than a vav does. It extends below the normal line of writing. And in this class, I will exaggerate those features greatly. <laughs> so hopefully there will be no uh, ambiguity in my writing. Um, okay, the vav is pronounced differently in different dialects of Hebrew. The dialect I am teaching is the Sephardic dialect, and in that dialect, it is pronounced as a V. So, in the dialect I'm teaching, it's pronounced identically to a bait with no dagish. Okay. Um, in Ashkenazic, it is pronounced the same. In the Yemenite dialect, the Vav is pronounced as a W. And uh, scholars are, uh, you know, there's kind of two camps among scholars, whether it was originally pronounced as a V or as a W. <clears throat> there's people on both sides. The majority seem to think it was pronounced as a W, but that doesn't mean they're right. Um, I tend to lean toward that uh, explanation, um, which I'll, I'll get to my reasoning for that in a minute. It's not really important what I think, because I'm teaching a dialect that's already established and that's spoken in modern Israel, which is the Hebrew I'm teaching. But, um, but anyway, uh, so we're going to teach the Vav being pronounced as a V. <coughs> right. That's why the pronunciation Yahweh has a W sound in it, is because a number of scholars think that the Vav was originally pronounced as a W. And um, although there are others who see it differently. So, um, but regardless, the modern convention in the Sephardic dialect is the V, so that's how I'm going to teach it, and you can do research on your own to make up your mind. Or if you find a tape recording of somebody speaking Paleo-Hebrew back about 3,000 years ago, please inform me. I want to hear it. I really do. Um, yeah. <laughs> yes, I, I'll, you can charge rent, and I'll, I'll pay to come see it, um, no doubt. So... No, seriously, if you have one, let me know. Um, <laughs> numerical value of Vav is 6. Um, in Paleo-Hebrew, the Vav looks something like this. Uh, the Hebrew word Vav means a nail or possibly a hook. And the Hebrew word Vav means nail. Um, now you'll notice that our first letters, okay, Aleph, Bait, Gimel, Dalit, He, have a very good correspondence to the Greek Alpha, Beta, Gamma, Delta, and Epsilon. If I write the Paleo above here, it's much even more obvious, although the Bait looks a little bit funny. Okay, and that became our A, B, C, D, E. 
the Vav does not fit that pattern. Um, so, the uh, next letter in the Greek alphabet is Zeta, which does not correspond to the Vav in any way. And of course, in English, is F, which neither corresponds to the Zeta nor to the Vav. It is possible that the Vav became the Greek Upsilon, which makes a, uh, a U sound similar to the possible original W of the Vav. But the Upsilon is way down further in the Greek alphabet. So that's a possibility. I am not as certain about saying that as I am about the first five and about, indeed, a number of the following letters. So for whatever reason, the Vav is out of place in the uh, evolution of the language into, into Greek and modern-day English. And the Vav has some interesting properties that, um, that we'll discuss here. Um, the Vav functions as a consonant, okay, so as the letter V, it's the consonant V. The Vav can also function as a vowel. And the way it does that, there, there are two ways that it does that. If you find a Vav with a dot directly over the top of it, okay, this dot is known as a cholam, right, and that signifies the vowel long O. Okay, so when you see a vav with this dot directly above it, it loses its V sound. It no longer has the V sound, and it makes the sound of long O. Okay, so for example, if we have a word, dalit, vav with cholam, dalit, okay, the dalit makes a D sound, the cholam makes a long O, the final dalit there, another D, so this is pronounced dode. Dode is in fact a word. Uh, dode means beloved. It can also mean uncle. Dode is where the name David comes from. In fact, that's what David's name means, is the beloved one. Okay, but this is how it's pronounced. The, again, the vav loses its v when this vowel is attached and becomes a long o. What's interesting about this, uh, another slightly confusing feature, is that this cholam vowel can appear without a vav, and it still makes the sound of a long o. Um, now, this word is always spelled this way, but it would be pronounced exactly the same like this, okay? So this dalit makes a D, followed by the cholam, making the long O, followed by the dalit. These two words would be pronounced exactly the same way, okay? Um, as you're reading Hebrew, you will notice this happening a lot especially if you read the Torah. Um, the Torah incorporates full, what, what they call the full cholam and the defective cholam. There's nothing wrong with the defective, it's just lacking a vav. Okay? And so you will see the same word spelled multiple ways in the Torah, sometimes with the vav, sometimes without it. It's still pronounced the same, it still means the same thing, it's just an alternate spelling. Uh, even the word Torah, you will find this done with, because Torah has an O in its first syllable. You'll see it spelled with a Vav, without a Vav, okay? Or uh, Kodesh, which means holy. That first long O sound, sometimes you'll find it with a Vav, sometimes without a Vav. It's the same word, means the same thing, pronounced the same way. It's just, it's just two different spellings. The convention in modern Hebrew and in this class will be that I'm going to use the full cholam whenever possible. Now, there are some words that are, are 
that as a matter of spelling don't include the vav. They have a colon but no vav, and those I will point out as we go. Um, but the modern convention is whenever possible, insert the vav to make a full vowel. And so I'll do that too. It eliminates some confusion. But just be aware that when you're reading actual texts in Hebrew, you will find both. Okay? Are there any questions about the cholam? Yes, it's, yeah, there are many, many layers to the scriptures. I don't know. <laughs> I honestly don't know what the meanings of the names of the vowels are, except for one. I do know, the, I do know what, uh, what the patach means, but the others, I actually don't know the meanings of the names. I could look them up, though. When you say the actual Hebrew text, you're talking modern, too. The modern Hebrew text that you go Um. Uh, so the question is, is there a difference between ancient texts and modern texts in the defective spellings? The question is, is the use of this uh, basically the same in modern and ancient? Well, anything that's originally composed today. So if somebody were to write their own work in Hebrew today, they would more than likely use the full spelling. Okay. Um, but when they, are, when they are copying ancient texts... They maintain the spellings that are in those original texts. So, if the, if so, a modern Torah scroll is written exactly the same way an ancient one was written. The same spellings, the same they they you know um, scribes are very meticulous. Hebrew scribes are very meticulous about okay, things. So this is this is more of a historic um, characteristic of this particular. Vowel. Right. If you if you were if you were to read a Hebrew newspaper. For example, you would you would not find gotcha. defective spellings, but if you open a Tanakh now that's written in Hebrew, no matter when that was written, it's a copy of a copy of a copy of a copy, and they maintain the exact same spellings as the ancient ones. The modern newspaper would not have a colon. <clears throat> yeah, the modern newspaper would would always have a full, except for the vowels are not the mark. R well, right. The it, well, it would have the vowel point. It has to have the vowel point. Without this vowel point, we don't know how to pronounce this word. Okay, because... Is there vowel points in the newspaper? <clears throat> um, I'm not sure. I haven't actually seen a Hebrew newspaper. Right. Well, in, in, in Paleo-Hebrew, okay, in ancient Hebrew, they, the vowel points are, are a relatively recent um, addition to the Hebrew language. They were always pronounced. You know, you, you can't pronounce things with just consonants. Um, but indicating where the vowels are via these, these little dots and dashes, um, that was actually invented by the Masoretes, responsible also for the Masoretic text. Um, so, um, but yeah, if you're reading something that, it's, that isn't pointed, of course you won't find that, but if you find something that is, does have vowel points, uh, whenever you see a cholam in, in a, in a text that is composed today, this is the standard spelling, is always include the Vav. It's less confusing that way, and, um, and it makes it clearer when there are no vowel points, which vowel should go there. Um, yeah, for all pur our purposes, we're always going to read things with vowel points, and, um, and if you find a Torah scroll, it'll have vowel points in it. So... Um, a t yeah, a Torah scroll or a right, right. Yeah, you know, yeah. If you get one from you know a Dead Sea Scroll, Torah scroll or something, um, no, no, it wouldn't. <laughs> right, it would have all the <clears throat> right. So, um, yeah. But if you find a pointed text of the Torah or of the Tanakh, you're going to find alternate spellings for words. Okay. They're pronounced the same. They mean the same thing. They're, okay, I'm not saying there's not deeper spiritual significance. There very well may be. But um, linguistically, <laughs> it's the same word. So, so as we translate these words, we translate them identically into English, although we do lose whatever meaning there may be there by doing the translation. You know, there's no way to know, reading the English of... of um, that verse that 
Foley is spelled one way here and one way here. It's just, you know. So now you may infer that the holiness has to be on a different level just based on other verses that talk about God and talk about holiness, but you're not going to see it in the verse itself. So. Okay, so that is the Cholam. Um, again, it can appear with a Vav or without one. It makes the same sound of long O. Okay. All right, the Vav can be used to form another vowel sound as well. So if you find a vav with a dot in the center, this is another vowel called a shuruk. And knowing the names of the vowels is not as important as knowing their sounds. As you've learned, I don't even know the meanings of the names of the vowels. Um, the shuruk makes the sound of long u, as in use, or the u as in moon. <laughs> yes, shuruk. That is one handy thing about the names of the vowels is they uh, include the sound the vowel makes in the name. So the comets, comets, okay, the cholam, the shuruk, okay. So that's one little hint that they, they have built in. Yes, the shuruk makes an oo. Now you'll notice this dot in the center of other letters, and when it's in the center of any other letter, it's a dagish. Okay? But in a vav, it indicates a shuruk, shuruk vowel. So in the shuruk vowel, again, the vav loses its v, loses its consonantal sound, and becomes a vowel entirely. So I don't have a word yet that incorporates this, but just a nonsense word. Um, well, if we were to have Dalit, Vav with Shuruk, and then Dalit, we'd have a D, an O, an O sound, followed by a D. Okay, so this would be pronounced dude, which is in fact not a Hebrew word. Okay, <laughs> there is no Hebrew word dude, there is a word dode. Okay, but that is how the Shuruk would function. Sometimes you'll even see a shuruk um, at the beginning of a word. Okay, but that, that is the vowel sound that this makes. Okay, so any questions about the shuruk? All right. Okay. Well, um, see how much time we've got left here. Oh wow, lots of time left. Um, I don't want to jump ahead too fast, um, but I will. <laughs> so um, I don't have handouts for this just yet, and nothing's posted online for this just yet. Uh, but I'll go ahead and cover a few more letters, and we'll just cover them again next week at the beginning of class. Uh, the letter after the Vav is the Zion. Zion makes the sound of the letter Z. Being the seventh letter, its numerical value is seven. In Paleo-Hebrew, the Zion looks something like this. And uh, the Hebrew word Zion means a weapon. So it's thought that this could be a sword or it could alternatively also be a plow. Uh, reminds me of the verse, the swords will be beaten into plowshares. Perhaps it's a, an allusion to the Zion letter having this dual nature. 
Um, the Zion became the Greek Zeta. It became our English Z. Right. And the eighth letter is the chet. Um, now, chet has an unfortunate spelling. When you see that, you want to say chet. And it is not chet. <laughs> And in fact, anytime you see a Hebrew word transliterated with a CH, it is not a CH sound. Hebrew has no CH. Okay? The chet sound makes a CH, which is depicted as a CH, but is pronounced, it's kind of a spitting sound in the back of your throat. Um, you'll hear it in German, like uh, the composer uh, Bach, okay, is properly pronounced that way. Um, some Hebrew words, Hanukkah, also known as Hanukkah. It's actually pronounced Hanukkah uh, or challah bread. Okay, it's that ch, ch sound, ruach. All right, it takes a little practice, and you want to do it with somebody at least five feet away from you, um, unless they're related. Uh, and <laughs> so, um, <laughs> right, yes, definitely. Uh, Somebody good-natured. Um, but anyway, no, don't spit on people, but the hate does take a little bit of practice before you can do it without having to think about it real hard. Um, numerical value of hate is 8. And uh, I mentioned the hay before, having that gap, and of course the hate does not. That gap in the upper left. It does. It does, in fact, have this little little tail. And in the, when you see a more stylized script, what I'm writing up here is sort of a skeletal version of the letters. Stylized scripts will always have yeah, it looks almost like a tav, but anyway, they'll always have this little little point here in the upper left, and the hay will. Something like this. Yes? Over here? Uh, you will see it. Yeah, this, this is the way you'll commonly see it, is, is the more stylized version. I write it like this to give you an idea of the shape and how the shape differs from other letters. The way I've got it uh, on the handouts there is the way you'll more commonly see it, is the font you'll more often see. If it's printed, you'll see it like this, but if you're writing it, it's over here. Right, when I'm writing it on a, on a whiteboard and when I'm spelling words quickly. So what the kids would do first, what I'm uh, yeah, depending on the teacher. <laughs> you know, I like, to, I like to keep things as simple as possible and grasp concepts as quickly as possible and then move into particulars. That's kind of my method of teaching. Um, it especially comes in handy when we get into grammar because if you're concerned about every little nuance of every rule at first, it becomes overwhelming. But if you can use it right away, even if you're using it incorrectly, and I do fill you in on the details later, <laughs> I don't just leave you hanging. Um, but if you can use it right away, to, for me, that's a great aid to memory, is being able to use it immediately. And I would rather find out later, oh, okay, there's this little detail that I need to fill in, than be, yeah, than, than be real meticulous at first without knowing what I'm doing. So. But yes, the, the, the letters that I'm drawing up here are greatly simplified. Um, but, uh, but yeah, the way, they're, the way they're printed out there, the way it's online, um, the way you'll find it in pretty much any book you read uh, will be the more stylized forms. Now, the Paleo-Hebrew did look more like this because it's a much... Uh, 
well, it, it was a form that they could both write with a pen and also engrave um, in stone. And this is not easy to engrave <laughs> in stone. <laughs> but uh, the, the paleo hate, much more doable. Okay. So, um, yeah, I mean, uh, so yeah, don't let that throw you very much. Just every top of every letter is going to look like this. <laughs> um, but the relative sizes and shapes are going to be identified by the way, the, the stick form that I'm writing up there. So, if anybody's confused on that at any point, let me know and I'll, I'll show the contrast between uh, my simplified form and the stylized version. Um, Another thing that the simple form does is, you know, this is a dalit, this is a resh, and the stylized, that's a dalit, and that's a resh. And actually, some fonts even have this, you know, to where it's really easy to confuse them. And it's, uh, it's just an unfortunate feature of how, <laughs> how the script came to be. Um, there's very little confusion in the Paleo script. So, yes, the hate in the Paleo represents, uh, it could be a ladder or it could be a fence. Um, there's both, both are potential uh, choices. There, um, a lot of times the giveaway for what the letter means is the name of the letter. However, there's no Hebrew letter or no Hebrew word uh, hate. So there, perhaps there was at one time, but um, there is not today. So it's uncertain what what they're getting at. It does look a lot like a ladder. Um, it became. It could well be. It could well be Jacob's ladder. Um, it became the Greek eta, the Latin H. Uh, oh, that. Parapet. Oh, parapet, yeah. Right. I don't know what that word is in Hebrew, though. That'd be interesting. Might might give a hint. But um, yeah, and some some of the paleo symbols are pretty clear cut what they were intended to be, and uh, some of them some of them aren't. There's different ideas, but you know, and the hate is one where it's well, we got some ideas, <laughs> you know, um, but it's not as uh, it's not as easy as say a dalit, because dalit means door. So it's like okay, that's clearly what they're getting at, and then a little, a little bit of analysis reveals that well, living in tents, the door is a flap, a triangular flap. So, um, so yes, that is the hate. Um, so, are there any questions about uh, the alphabet or any of the vowels that I've covered so far? Yes. <coughs> right. Yeah, that is a. Um, yeah, our comment is that she's heard that there is a. I'm repeating your questions be, so that people online can hear because they can't hear what anybody else is saying. They can only hear what I'm saying because <laughs> I've got the mic on me. So it's a little awkward, but I'm going to repeat your questions <laughs> into the mic. Um, yeah, her comment is that there's a yod in every letter, and she's heard that before. And that derives from the fact that a yod looks like this. And every letter in the stylized form has this on the upper left side. So a bait looks something like that. The upper left corner is always going to incorporate sort of this yod looking 
uh, thing in it. Now, <clears throat> that's a modern script convention. In the Paleo-Hebrew, there is by no means a yod in every letter. Um, if a yod was just a straight line, there would be, but, uh, but a yod is not a straight line. So that is a feature of the modern script and not of the Paleo script. But uh, that is a, you could make that case that there, there is a, a yod in every modern, modern script letter. Oh, okay. A lot of the, a lot of the Hebrew letters are. Like we put the big A up and then light it up for different letters and numbers. <coughs> right. It's the same way. Yeah. Star. Yeah. A potential interpretation of the Star of David, as I mentioned, David's name derives from Dod. And in fact, David's name is spelled the same way with different vowel pointings. In Paleo Hebrew, it would look like this. So if, in fact, the Star of David did originate with David, or somebody uh, memorializing David, you could take the first and last letters of his name and put them together like that. Dalit, Dalit. Come up with a six-pointed star. So, makes sense. You know, historically, it's kind of uncertain where, where it cropped up, but uh, the logical progression is there <laughs> anyway. Um, okay, well, I don't want to jump too far ahead in the material, but if there's any questions on any topic pertaining to Hebrew, <laughs> if I can answer it, I will. Um, Right. But the tabernacles certainly were more of a rectangular. Right. Were there individual tents similar to that or similar to what we have? Uh, yeah. So would all tent flaps be triangular? Um, clearly on the tabernacle it was not. It was a square. Um, I would think that the tent flaps of the people camping around would probably be triangular because I would think that that's the most efficient way to, uh, you know, wrap a goat skin around a series of poles. Um, I don't know, but, uh, but yes, the, it, <coughs> right, the, the tabernacle itself, though, was, was a rectangular, rectangular shape, and the curtain, you know, of course, drapes over, so it's a, it's a square, which looks, looks a lot more like the modern Dalit than the ancient one, so. <laughs> Up in the desert is hot. I don't want a little triangle. Tent. I want a big tent. Rectangular. Rectangular door. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no doubt. <laughs> no doubt. And if you were wealthy, you probably had one of those. <laughs> but being a, an Israelite slave going out among, you know, two million other people, probably, probably had a smaller uh, living space. 